And yes, okay. So hello everyone. My name is Daniela Osatsky Stern and I am honored to open this virtual event Jesus. organized by the Holocaust Studies Program at Western Galilee College in Akko, Israel. On September 28, 1941, the Germans handed announcements all over Kiev, instructing the city's Jews to report to a concentration point the next day. The Jews were ordered to bring documents, clothes, money, and valuables. They were warned that anyone who disobeyed would be shot dead. The next day, the Jews of the city showed up and were taken to the murder site in Babi Yar. Within two days, on September 29 and 30, the eve of the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, 33,771 Jews were murdered in Babi Yar by the Nazis with the help of their local collaborators. The place in Kiev later became the symbol of the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. In this international conference that we are holding today, it is important for us to discuss the connection between the mass murders in the initial phase of Operation Barbarossa, 80 years after the event, and the military operations. We brought together outstanding speakers who would share with us the research on the various topics connected to that point. Some technical notes, we are recording the sessions and would upload it to our website and please keep your microphones on mute. I would like to thank my colleagues, Dr. Yaron Pasher and Dr. Boaz Cohen, head of the organizing team. And thank you all for being with us. And now I am honored to invite Dr. Karmit Gal, um, the international coordinator of the of the Western Galilee College to say a few words. Permit the floor is yours. Hi, Daniela. Thank you, everyone. It's very nice to meet you all. I am speaking on behalf of the president of the college, Professor Nisim Ben David who couldn't uh, be present in this conference and sends his regards. So thank you all for participating in this such important conference. Um, the conference today is about the slaughter of 33,771 Jews by Nazi soldiers in Babi Yar. When the Nazis invaded Soviet Ukraine in June, 1941, once the bloody battles for control of the territory were over, it became easy to brand the Jews as enemies of Ukraine and to get local support of Ukrainians in Nazi plans. People in Lviv, formerly Lamberg, began be being beaten, stripped naked, and dragged through the streets by their neighbors. By September, Kiev was taken after fierce fighting, left parts of the city destroyed. And once again, the Jews became a convenient scapegoat for both occupiers and locals. They were rounded up and taken by the Babiar Ravine on the city outskirts, where between September 29 and 30, more than 33,000 were murdered. The collaboration with the Nazis was an important part that should be discussed and learned. The Holocaust teaches us all how important it is to stand against evil forces, to raise our voices and not to hesitate in leading others against governments, politicians and authorities when they start crossing moral lines and not to wait until it's too late to object those forces because then they become too strong. I wish us all an interesting conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kermit. And now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Yaron Pasher, who heads our military studies group. Yaron. Uh, you 
you are on mute. Can you hear me now? Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Komet. Uh, distinguished guest, Professor Overy. This is, uh, 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 we are very honored to have you here with us. Uh, I would like to begin with introducing to you uh, an essential figure uh, to this event uh, who will uh, say a few words of greeting. Um, Major General Amidro uh, was the National Security Advisor to the Israeli Prime Minister and Chairman of the National Security Council. He served for 36 years in senior IDF posts, including commander of the military colleges of the IDF, among them the National Defense College, Staff and Command College, and Tactical Command Academy. He was military secretary to the Minister of Defense, director of the Intelligence Analysis Division and Military Intelligence, and chief intelligence officer of the Northern Command. He is a distinguished fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, and a senior fellow at the Jewish Institute for National Security of America in Washington, DC. General Amidro, Amidro is also the author of three books on intelligence and military strategy, Reflections on Army and Security, Theory and Practice in Winning Counterinsurgency War. Uh, my personal acquaintance with General Amidro goes way back to my days in Oxford when he was kind enough to meet me there and help me shape some of my essential insights about military maneuvers on the Eastern Front. Uh, General Mitro, please, the Zoom floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this event. Uh, it is very rare that I'm taking part in events which are pure academic. I'm all from the side of the practitioners um, speaking about their experience. Um, but yes, I remember the meeting with uh, Yaron, and the question that since then I am thinking very much about is what is the connection between the Holocaust and the uh, Second War um, itself? We, we have many lessons from the wars. As officers, we learn the history. Um, we learn from prominent generals how to conduct wars and so on and so forth. But what is the real connection between the 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 um the Holocaust, which um, cost the 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 Jewish uh, people more than hundred years, you know, the number of Jews in the world will come to the number which was before the Holocaust, only uh, after hundred years after the the Second World War that we, we lost hundred years. Uh, what is the connection between this um, uh, Jewish event, although it's we're well, not only Jews, of course. And the, uh, and the Second World War. The question that I ask myself many times is, what could be different from the um, point of view of the outcome of the war? If Hitler was not so eager to complete the mission of destruction of all the Jewish people, if Hitler decided not to allocate what was needed for the mass murder of Jews all over um, Europe, uh, what could be different if the Nazis um, doing the war without the Holocaust? One conclusion is, is easier to, to make. It's about the, um, the nuclear capability. Uh, without the Jews, the Nazis uh, couldn't succeed to um, have their own uh, nuclear uh, warhead. With the Jews, probably America was not the only one having the nuclear capability in 40, uh, in 45. But what is the connection between the logistic which was needed for the Holocaust and the results of the war or the conditions of the war from the Nazis' point of view? How could be achieved more from their point of view without the effort and the um, sources which had been allocated to murder the Jews all over Europe. I don't think that there is an answer to this question, but it's just showing us how the, the commitment of Hitler to, to, to murder as many Jews as possible and to clean Europe from Jews was something which was so deep in his um, uh, philosophy and the, the way that he conducted his 
was that he was ready to pay all the prices which were needed, but to complete the mission. And Babi Yar is one of the examples. Babi Yar is one of the examples that was, it took place when the German army uh, didn't make yet the, the decision where to go in the next stage. Do go, do, should they go direct into um, the heart of the USSR towards uh, Moscow or to turn their forces to the, to the south towards the energy and the food? Uh, what should be the next stage? But at the same time that they um, made many um, um, decisions about that, and, and they were very busy with the question how to implement the decision, they didn't hesitate. More than 33,000 Jews in less than 48 hours were murdered in a very, um, in, a, in a way that cannot be forgotten. I visited Babi Yar more than five times. And every time, again and again, the, the gap between the quietness of the place and the horrible situation of the Jews marching from their houses in Kiev, the five um, kilometer to, the, to, the, to Babi Yar, hour after hour, after hour, I think about group of thousands of, uh, of people, um, old people, young people, children, women, men, walking from the center of, ba of um, Kiev into, the, into Babi Yar and murdered by um, German soldiers. Yes, there was a cooperation with the locals, but at the end of the day, it's the Germans, Nazis, it's the Wehrmacht who did the, the murder and it cannot be forgotten. And the, the, the gap, the frustration that Every, uh, every Israeli who is visiting the place from the quietness of, the, of this um, creek uh, compared to the mass murder of so many Jews in this place brought many Israelis to the conclusion which was the milestone of the, um, the, the Israeli, uh, um, the Israeli uh, national security philosophy. Israel cannot trust anyone to um, defend itself. Israel should be in a position to defend itself by itself, whatever will be the price. And in Israel, we are ready to pay the price because we understand that one of our, one of the, um, our main goal, one of the, the raison d'etre of the existence of the independent Jewish state is to make sure that it will not happen again. And for that, we have to be strong. And if you ask yourself many questions about the philosophy, and the policy of the state of Israel, it cannot be understood without the lessons which had been drawn by the founders of the state uh, from the experience of the Holocaust. And no question, Babi Yar is one of the uh, places in which it is becoming very clear because of what it was not the one um, period. It was two long days in which Jews went into their death and no one was there to help them and to save them. So thank you very much for inviting me for this event. I think it's very important to deal with the two sides or two faces of this, um, of this event, the Second World War, from the Holocaust point of view and from the military point of view and to see where are the relations between them and the lessons that should be drawn from this um, very uh, sad uh, situation. Thank you very much again. Thank you so much. And now I would like to introduce our chair for the first session, Professor Yvonne Kozlovsky Golan, a senior lecturer chairing the graduate program for culture and film studies at the University of Haifa. Professor Kozlovsky Golan researches the connection between history, law, and film. Her interdisciplinary research examines the historical knowledge and the cultural and social discussion following the representation of history in cinema. She is the author of many studies and five books. Among her publications are The Shaping of the Holocaust Visual Image by the Nuremberg Trials and Sites of Amnesia, Amnesia The Lost Historical Consciousness of the Mizrahi Jewry. Professor Kozlowski Golan, the floor is yours.
you can uh, unmute yourself. Thank you, Daniela. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to see all of you and to see we, that we have uh, uh, four full screens, which means that this uh, topic is profoundly important. Uh, thank you for Boaz and, from, yeah, and for Yaron for uh, this event. Thank you, the participants in my panel and the others. Um, Edward Westerman, uh, Noam Korb, Leonid Rhein, and uh, Forish Akos, if I'm saying, pronouncing the names right. Um, we will start today with the first uh, presenter today. Um, that will be um, Professor Edward uh, West, Wester, Westerman. I, I think it's different. It's written differently here. Uh, Professor Westerman is from, uh, he has this PhD in modern European history, University of North Ca uh, Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, he will speak today about the uh, incremental uh, annihilation in Latvia, Einsatzkommando 2, and the ritual of mass murder. Professor um, Westman, Westerman uh, is a very fruitful researcher. He have a uh, very uh, three interesting book. Um, the one, the last one is uh, Drunk and Genocide, Alcohol and Mass Murder in Nazi Germany in two, uh, 2021. And then we have uh, Hitler's uh, Ausprägung and the Indian Wars, uh, comparing uh, conquest and genocide uh, from Norman University. And uh, the third one from 2005, Hitler's police uh, battalion enforcing racial war in the East. Uh, Professor Westerman, the Zoom is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Ivan. And uh, thank you to the organizers. I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen right now. So hopefully this will come up for everyone. Okay. Uh, the Baltic states were one of the first areas to experience the early phase of the Wehrmacht's Blitzkrieg into the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941. For the Jews living in these areas, the rapid advance of the German military along with SS and police forces in June and July proved catastrophic, leading to the almost complete annihilation of the region's Jewish communities in the first six months of the war. This paper focuses on the fate of the Jewish community in Latvia and specifically in Lapaya to offer insights on what I describe as the process of incremental annihilation at the periphery of the final solution. Mass murder was a defining characteristic of the German Soviet war and involved perpetrators from a number of organizations within the Nazi administration, the SS and police, local auxiliaries, and the Wehrmacht. The scope and scaling of the killing varied based on the institutional affiliations of the perpetrators and according to factors such as geography and chronology. With respect to the role of space, recent Holocaust scholarship has focused on the motive force of genocide in relation to the influence of the center versus the periphery. While the order for the destruction of European Jews came from Berlin, the concept of the periphery in Latvia was fluid and defies a simple binary between Berlin and Riga, but rather includes fractals of this relationship between Riga and the Latvian countryside. This paper focuses on the way in which actors at the local level negotiated and implemented plans for the destruction of the Latvian Jews. The actions of Einsatzkommando II and the manner in which the mass murder of the Latvian Jews developed during the autumn of 1941 highlights the conduct of mass murder, often as an incremental process involving routine small-scale killings. The daily activities of the SS and police offices in Lapaya offer not only a view of the quotidian process of annihilation, but also the types of rituals and activities associated with the preparation, conduct, and celebration of these acts. 
drawing from German SS and police sources, survivor and witness testimonies, and the post-war interrogation records of SS Sergeant Hans Baumgartner, a member of EK2, this presentation examines the process and velocity of killing in Latvia in the fall of 1941. And it also offers insights into the mindsets of the killers on the periphery. In the case of Latvia, members of Einsatzgruppen A entered cities in the South by the end of June, 1941, and subsequently reached the capital Riga on July 1st. During the initial occupation, individual detachment, tile commandos, composed of SS and police forces, spread across the countryside, promoting massacres against the Jewish population by indigenous paramilitary groups or conducting their own mass shootings. A report by the security police addressing operations in Latvia declared, quote, the goal of Einsatzkommando uh, 2 from the beginning was a radical solution to the Jewish problem through the execution of all Jews. A member of EK2, Baumgartner, revealed that he had learned from his direct superior, SS Lieutenant Wolfgang Kugler, in early July, that the unit's task involved the, quote, annihilation of the Jews by shootings. By the end of October 1941, members of the SS and police, local auxiliaries, and in some cases, Wehrmacht personnel, had murdered at least 30,000 Latvian Jews, or some 43% of the country's Jewish population. Of those still alive, the majority were concentrated and confined in ghettos in Riga, Daugav Pils, as well as in Lapaya. In November and December, these remaining Jewish communities faced a second round of large-scale murder, resulting in the near-complete annihilation of Latvia's Jewish population. In fact, the meeting protocol of the notorious Vanze Conference, held on January 20th, 1942, listed a mere 3,500 remaining Latvian Jews, or about 5% of the pre-war population. The experience of the Jews in Latvia in general, and specifically the actions of EK2 in Lapaya during the initial six months of the German occupation, exemplify several facets of Nazi rule. First, the experience of the Jews in Lapaya and of their co-religionists in the Baltic states writ large demonstrates the routinization of mass murder from the first days of the Nazi occupation and highlights the incremental process of annihilation. Second, a focus on Lapaya, a naval base of strategic importance on the coast of the Baltic Sea, reveals the interconnectedness between the Nazi civil administration, SS and police forces, Latvian police auxiliaries, and Wehrmacht forces in shaping the course of mass murder. It also highlights elements of cooperation and competition between these institutions in the conduct of genocide. Finally, the murder of the Jews of Lapaya provides a key insight into how population policies functioned at the local level and exposes the ways by which Nazi administrators sought to pre uh, project, uh, pr protect and exert power at the outermost periphery. Before the German invasion, Lapaya had a large and vibrant Jewish community of over 7,000, with numerous religious, social, and educational organizations, including a Yiddish high school, various trade schools, and 10 synagogues. After a week-long battle for the city between German and Soviet forces, the Jews and the symbols of their religious community became daily targets of abuse by the occupiers. Aaron Westermann, a survivor recalled the entry of German military forces on June 29th. He observed, quote, already in the very first days, there were Jews murdered, and, quote, almost every day there was news of arrested and murdered Jews. The process of murder, as in other cities and towns throughout the East, often included rituals of humiliation, especially aimed at Jewish leaders and the artifacts of their faith. In the case of the former, German forces upon their entry into Daugav Pils, quote, systematically terrorized and humiliated Jewish men by forcing them to, quote, jump like frogs, make distorted faces, and perform all kinds of ridiculous gestures with their hands, heads, and feet as their tormentors laughed. 
In some cases, the abuse included sexual violence. In the town of Bauska, Jewish women became the targets of sexual abuse by the German occupiers as they were, quote, forced to dance in the nude before being raped and killed. With regard to symbols of religious faith, the Germans ordered La Paya's Jews to participate in the demolition of the city synagogues and use these materials for other construction projects. Furthermore, Kugler, the commander of EK2, had Torah scrolls from the synagogues unrolled on Firehouse Square. Before proceeding to ride his horse over the sacred text, a ritual of humiliation intended as one witness asserted, quote, to eradicate the spirit of Judaism itself. The Wehrmacht also took an active role in the persecution. The city's military commandant not only issued the initial anti-Jewish regulations on July 5th, but also authorized a reprisal shooting of 30, quote, Bolshevist hostages three days later and threaten the execution of 100 hostages for every wounded German soldier. Likewise, the naval commandant of La Paya, Commander Hans Kavelmacher, requested additional SS forces be sent at the end of July to accelerate the murder of the city's Jews, a request that was approved and led to the execution of some 1,000 male Jews on July 24th and July 25th. For those caught in between the military and civilian administration, small and large-scale killing became a daily fact of life. Mikhail Libawa spent over two years working at the Latpaya headquarters of EK2 and described how during this time, quote, regular, relatively small actions involving the murder of 20, 30, or 40 people proved to be the rule. In fact, these acts range from individual murders, such as that of the Viennese-born composer Walter Hahn, who had fled Austria in 1938, to mass killings involving hundreds of victims. On June 29th, SS and police forces began killing Jews and suspected communists in groups of 25 to 30 throughout the day by using the tank ditches in the city's Rhinus Park as ready-made graves. This initial wave of killing continued for a week during which an estimated 1,430 persons perished. The park, however, soon turned out to be a poor choice as the summer heat and the shallow covering over the graves caused a stench to which the Germans responded by having the Jews disinter the bodies and transport them out to sand dunes near the naval base before murdering these work details. The new murder site, located next to the lighthouse, became one of three locations for the murder of La Paya's Jews throughout the remainder of the occupation. Throughout the first three weeks of July, the partial detachment of EK2 established a ritual for murder. Early in the morning, 25 to 60 Jews were loaded onto trucks and taken to a prepared grave in the dunes where they were forced to undress and shot. For his part, Baumgartner recalled the regularity of weekly executions conducted in the early morning and remarked that for, quote, smaller executions, groups of fewer than 20, the firing squad would conduct the killings first and then return for breakfast, a mundane and equally horrifying reflection of the normalization of murder among these men. These early killings in La Paya also highlight a key point related to the continuing contest between the Reich Kommissar Oslan, Henrich Lohse's office, and security police forces within Latvia proper. Outside of Riga, Lohse's administrative headquarters, SS and police forces enjoyed great autonomy at the local level and reduced administrative supervision, allowing for more freedom of action. Between June and August, killings both small and large stretched across Latvia, especially in towns and villages. In Resekni, SS and police forces began killing groups of 20 to 60 Jews daily in the first week of July, before conducting a mass execution uh, using over 30 trucks to transport thousands of Jews from the local prison to a wooded site, the Akupani Hills near the city. In Bauska, 
SS and police forces executed an estimated 2,000 Jewish men, women, and children held in the town's ghetto in a nearby forest during July. In another example of the accelerating pace of annihilation outside of the capital, a mass killing of at least 1,000 Jewish men took place in Daugavpils on July 9th and July 10th. Witnessed by Wehrmacht soldiers and their, quote, sweethearts, the local Latvian population, and filmed by German authorities. The Office of the Wehrmacht Armaments Inspection, in a report on August 11th, discussing the, quote, Jewish question, identified the disparity between killings in Riga and in other areas of Latvia. The report noted that while Riga had, quote, hardly been touched in any way, the inspection team referred to mass shootings in Lapaya. In one respect, the military inspector's knowledge of the killings in Lapaya is not surprising since groups of soldiers and sailors gathered to watch executions in July and August at the lighthouse site. The Wehrmacht also hints at a critical point involving the decentralization of mass murder in Latvia and the key role of individual SS and police commanders in establishing the rate and velocity of killing. In fact, the willingness to use one's own initiative in pursuit of the goals of Nazi racial policy was a desired trait for leaders at all levels of the Einsatzgruppen. Walter Munch, a member of the staff of EGA, made exactly this point during post-war testimony. Quote, I mean, today, one really makes completely different and false conceptions of how it, i.e. the killing, really took place. He continued, quote, in effect, the unit leader had the possibility without any negotiation and without any questions, he could immediately order and conduct an execution. This possibility was vested in every unit leader, end quote. This was certainly the case for Lapaya, as noted by Baumgartner, who testified that his commander, Kugla, quote, had the power over life and death. The command responsibility given to the Einsatzgruppen leaders, from the top to the lowest levels, emphasized initiative and self-reliance in pursuit of mass murder. And I believe Captain Korb will be sp speaking more about this later. In this sense, Carl Yeager's efforts as commander of EK-3 comes immediately to mind, as do the actions of his subordinate, SS Lieutenant Joachim Haman. In fact, Haman, with a squad of eight to 10 SD men, accompanied by auxiliaries, moved throughout Lithuania in the first two months of the invasion, committing tens of thousands of murders. In the case of EK-3, ingenuity at lower levels of command found expression in killings that crossed across the geographic and political boundaries of individual commissariats. While the majority of those killed by EK-3 resided in Lithuania, EK-3 entered Daugavpils repeatedly between July and August, murdering 9,012 Jewish men, women, and children and 573, quote, active communists. As Yitzhak Arad noted, the tempo of annihilation was, quote, not uniform, and there were periods in which the murder actions moved at great speed and others in which the pace was slower. In the case of the latter, the murder of 37 Jews in Lapaya on September 23rd provides one example of the incremental pace of annihilation. Importantly, SS and police forces in Lapaya distinguished between those capable of work and those seen as a burden. Kugler made this point explicit in an activity report of October 2nd, in which he noted the execution of 241 of the city's Jews over the previous eight days. In the report addressed to SS and police city leader, SS Lieutenant Colonel Fritz Dietrich, he declared, quote, the elimination of the elderly Jewish men and women in Libau, who do not come in consideration for labor, is in motion, end quote. The killing continued over the next two weeks, during which SS and police forces murdered another 214 of the city's Jews, as well as 40 communists. With respect to these killings, it is unclear whether the total includes 67 Jews executed in Lapaya on October 11th, by the local order police forces. Regardless, these three weeks of killing alone reduced the city's Jewish population by over 
bringing it well below 4,000. One example of the cum cumulative effects of annihilation experienced over the course of the German occupation as a result of the joint efforts of security police and order police forces. Security police plans called for the murder of an even greater number of si the city's Jewish population in October. However, Loza's concern about the loss of skilled labor and complaints from Nazi district administrators led to his direct intervention, ostensibly to prevent further, quote, wild executions in the city. Dr. Walter Alnoa, the Gebietskommissar or district commissar responsible for the Paya, had raised concerns about the, quote, numerous mass shootings of the Jews in the last weeks of October. He cited the murder of 470 persons in Lapaya, as well as the annihilation of the Jewish community of Eisbruch, including 12 men and 321 women and children. In the case of the latter, Alnor noted that both he and the local military commander had protested without success against the killing based on Loza's earlier instructions. Despite the protests, a group of SD men and Latvian auxiliaries left Lapaya early in the morning for Eisbrook, where the entire Jewish population, men, women, and children were confined. Beginning at 10 a.m., the police escorted small groups of 10 to a prepared gravesite. After finishing the executions at around 4 p.m., the perpetrators returned to Lapaya, stopping at the police cub police club for free food and beer before embarking upon a, quote, drinking bout to commemorate another day of mass murder. The destruction of the Jewish community in Eisbrook raises an important point. In discussions related to the influence of policymakers at the center, i.e. Berlin, versus the initiative taken by those at the periphery in the occupied areas, one element that is often missed is that the term periphery is a relative spatial concept. While Loza sought to establish his authority over SS and police forces in the RKO, the same bureaucratic and political battle was being waged in the General Commissariat of Latvia and between Nazi administrators and their SS and police con counterparts at the district level. In these cases, the struggle was between the leadership in the center in Riga and the periphery of the cities and villages. And I'll just briefly note, I showed this, uh, this slide from Yahad because it shows a blank spot on the map. There are only about 32 killing sites that are located in Latvia right now that are designated. And there are many, many more uh, to, be, uh, to be uncovered there. In conclusion, while mass shootings tend to be the focus of most legal proceedings and historical accounts, the regular small-scale killing actions that typified daily life in Lapaya demonstrates the way in which murder was normalized among the perpetrators, leading to the cumulative annihilation of the local Jewish population, a number totaling 11,860 victims by mid-October. Van Hot Fest, a survivor, recalled how, quote, the murderers raged with particular fury in rural areas and in small Latvian towns where it took the gangs of murderers only days to exterminate the entire Jewish population. This routinization of murder can be seen in the bi-monthly situation reports of the SS and police city leader in Lapaya. A report of December 1st, 1941, noted the arrest of, quote, communist agitators and revealed the execution of 45 persons, including 10 communists and 35, quote, politically incriminated Jews. He also referred to executions in the two-week period that included 35 communists and 53 Jews, as well as the, quote, evacuation of 101 Sinti and Roma to Saldus, who were, quote, executed there. With respect to the execution of the Jews, one Latvian uh, SD auxiliary, Yasef Dinats, discussed his participation in these murders of 30 to 40, person, 30 to 40 persons in early December at Skedge. Over the course of the two hour action, he remembered the killers taking refreshment from a vat of coffee spiked with cognac. Despite the attention given to large scale killings, including the 15 to 17 December massacre of almost 3,000 Jewish men, women, and children at Skedge, the reality of mass murder in Lapaya and throughout Latvia found expression in daily and weekly smaller scale killings. 
that over a period of only four months left the countryside, quote, free of Jews. In this sense, the efforts by Nazi civil administration at every level to preserve a slave labor force often had minimal effects on SS and police units at the local level tasked with the final solution. Ultimately, this paper reveals the power of the periphery in the actions taken by individuals like Fritz Dietrich, Wolfgang Kugler, and Hans, Hans Baumgarten in creating facts on the ground that resulted in genocide. The road to the annihilation of La Paya's Jewish community may have originated in Berlin and wound its way through Riga, but it was the actions of a mere handful of men who transformed the idea from an apocalyptic fantasy into a real reality among the sand dunes on a Baltic beach. Thank you. Thank you so much for your very chilling um, speak. I, I'm still moved by it. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker will be Noam Korb. Uh, Noam is a captain in the Israeli army. Uh, is a, he's also a student of uh, political science in Haifa University and of Jewish history in Tel Aviv University. He is an independent Holocaust researcher and a student in Israeli Defense Force Tactical Command College. His article from Tears Come Rivers, from Rivers Come Ocean, from Ocean a Flood, the Poland Action in, from 1938 to 1939 was recently published in Yad Vashem Studies. Noam will speak today about the theory of the uh, Uptrag tactics and the early stage of the final solution. Noam, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kozolowski. Um, I will just uh, share my screen and I will start. Please. Can everybody see the presentation? Yes, and the stopper is on. Okay, so um, I'm very honored to be here today. In my lecture, I would like to um, discuss a Prussian military theory that called Auftrags tactic. I will soon explain what does it mean that uh, I think can help us all get better understanding of the final solution in its early stages. So first I would like to introduce uh, briefly this uh, military perception, and then we'll see actually how it's influenced the SS and the mass murders in uh, the East. So in this slide, we can actually see uh, the comparison between the Auftrags tactic, which means in English mission type tactics, um, and the former, um, the former perception, military uh, perception of the first tactic, the detailed order tactics. We can see that in both uh, types of tactics of command, they are given the objective and the mission in prior, okay? Both tactics, are given the, the mission and objective. The difference, the main difference between these uh, two perceptions is the fact that while using the Befels tactic, the order, uh, the order, order of tactics, the commander is also given the means and the plans. He's given every detail that he should do in battlefield, and he has almost no freedom to act uh, as, as he like. In Alpha tactic, in the other, on the other hand, He's only given the objective and the mission, he, and he is the one that needs to decide in the battlefield and also in the preparation before what he will actually do. The, the background of its appearance in the 19th century, in the period of the Napoleonic Wars, was the fact that the armies that time became much, much bigger. The battlefield became much more complex. And of course, many, many new technologies were, uh, um, were used and implemented into the battlefield, which made commanding much more complex. There was no more possible for a commander to go up on a hill, to take his binoculars, to look on the battlefield and to say to all of his units what they need to do. Th this understanding started in the early stages of the 19th century. And we can speak up of two important theoreticians in the Prussian army, two senior staff officers, Karl von Clausewitz and Gerhard von Scharnhorst that contributed a lot to this, uh, to the development of uh, this uh, theory. It was later inserted formally into the Prussian army and German Imperial army by Helmut von Molke the Elder, the chief of staff. And we can actually see how Helmut von Molke himself 
described this new uh, type of command. He said, diverse are the situation in which an officer has to act on the basis of, its, of his own view of the situation. It would be wrong if he had to wait for orders at times when no orders can be given, but most productive are his actions when he acts within the framework of his senior commander's intent. And this is very important because while um, using Auftrag's tactic, the commander just can't, can't just do whatever he likes. He needs to do only things that will bring him closer to the objective, to the goal of his commander. So as I said, this, uh, this military perception was inserted successfully into the German army in, uh, in the late, uh, in the late uh, 19th century, and of course used in the war against Austria, France, and later in the First World War. But after Germany lost in the First World War, there was a, a understanding among a very high rank officers in the, in the new established Reichswehr that in, during the, the First World War, there was no enough use in the Auftrags tactic, and too many, um, too many commanders actually used the older type of command, the Befehls tactic, giving no flexibility and initiative for execution for their subordinates. And thus, in the Reichswehr, the ethos of Auftrags tactic became even more important. And also after the establishment of the Wehrmacht, it was a very, very important ethos of this new established army, of course, in many, many uh, campaigns during the World War II, uh, it was used successfully, and we will not give uh, examples now because of the time, but there are many, many examples of this uh, successful use of this uh, theory. But what's interesting for our discussion is the fact that even though it's a military theory, it, is, it was also implemented in Nazi Germany into other bodies like the SS and had affected um, very much also later the mass murder of the Jews. We can see that uh, we will speak especially about uh, the Allgemeine SS and the Waffen SS, and we will see actually how this, um, this new, um, new method would, was learned in, uh, among them. So when we speak about uh, the SS and what they learned about Auftrag's tactic in the 1930s, we have to speak about three things. We need to speak about the cadets themselves, who they were. We need to speak about the cadre, and we need, of course, to speak about the syllabus. I would like to start with the syllabus and to see if actually this uh, perception was part of what the SS officers actually learned in school, in academy. So let's start actually with what Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf in 1939. He wrote that the principle which made the former Prussian army an admirable instrument of the German nation will have to become the basis of our state, state of constitution. Oh, sorry. That is to say, full authority over his subordinates must be invested in each leader and he must res be responsible to those above him. And this is also a very important thing about Auftrag's tactic because while using Auftrag's tactic, it is not only that you are in charge of what you do, you are also in charge of what your commander is doing. And if you understand that he gave you a order, an order that does not serve the objective anymore, in extreme situation, you are also allowed not to follow his orders. This is very, very important thing in Auftrag's tactic, which is a meritocratic um, type of command. So in the 1930s, a new uh, form of, uh, of uh, training in the SS was established, led by the Reichsminister Walter Dare, which was the Reich Minister of Food and Agriculture, a Nazi ideologist. It was called Schulung in die Tiefe, training into the deep. And at the beginning, there were no SS uh, permanent academies and the SS cadets started to learn like in, com uh, in temporal academies and uh, camps, like the one established in the Gleiber Castle in Gießen in, uh, in 1934. But later, the first SS academies were established like the one we can see here in Bad Tölz in Bavaria in which the SS cadets could learn uh, what they should have learned. We will soon see what they actually learned. We must say that the, the, first, the first commander of the school was Colonel Pauletov, which was a general in, uh, in uh, the German army. And also all the cadre at the beginning was, from, was taken from the Wehrmacht, taken or borrowed from the Wehrmacht because the SS himself could not give enough teachers to teach in these schools. 
And this is very, also very important to our understanding of the Auftrag Taktik, because if now we will look on a typical schedule of the, the SS Academy, we can see, oops, we can see that almost 30% of their, uh, of their weekly schedule were divided, dedicated to tactical and moving forces and military issues. And we can of course understand that when teachers from the Wehrmacht taught military issues and tactics and moving forces, they used what they know of tactic and using forces, which is of course Auftrags tactic. We can actually look on one of the SS light heft, the SS periodical that was very uh, popular that time and um, in which the SS cadets and SS officers could read some German, uh, some Nazi ideology together with uh, German uh, literature, philosophy and battle heritage. We can see a story written in early 1937 by a Nazi ideologist called von Leers, Johannes von Leers, uh, which is the name of the story is the Commandant von Graudenz. It tells the story we can see here of uh, von Leers on the screen. It tells the story of the Battle of Vienna, which was in 1807, 1806 to 1807, and in which the Prussian army lost to the French. And what's very interesting, Johannes von Leers decide to show this battle in, in order to teach the cadets and the SS officer a lesson about Auftrag tactic. What he actually says is this. He says that the Prussians didn't take any initiative and were always waiting to get orders from above them. This took revenge on them in battle. Okay, we can see here um, what actually I said now. So he criticizes a lot the German, uh, the, the Prussian forces, but then he goes and he wants to say that there was one commander that uh, played properly. This is the commander of Graudenz, General von Courbier, that was under a, a very, very long blockade in the town of Graudenz in Eastern Prussia. And he tells that many French uh, messengers came to uh, von Courbier and told him, uh, General von Courbier, you must know all of other Prussian units had already surrendered you should surrender as well. And he answered, and this we have his answer from uh, what uh, the, uh, mess, the French messenger, General Sabri actually wrote. We can see also here an illustration of uh, the moment when he got, uh, when he gave the message. He says, he said it of course in French, he, he was also a Hoganot and he said, he said this, your general is telling me that there is no more Prussian king, that the French have occupied the country. Oh, well, this can be. But if there is no more a king of Prussia, there is still a king of Graudenz. Say this to your general. This is very interesting. And then he, uh, von Leers, the one who writes the story, keep and tell us this. The story of General von Courbier has been told many times in the old Prussian army. It served as an example of fighting until the last minute. And when no command comes from above, the truth itself demands to keep and do. Therefore, the name of the old commander von Courbier entered with respect to the history of the Prussian army. We can actually see from this example how important was this ethos of the Auftrags tactic and how the SS cadets actually learned to, to be very, to take initiative in the battlefield, not to wait for orders from above and always to do whatever they can do in order to serve the, the objective. So we spoke about the syllabus, about the cadets, we can say that most of them during the 1930s, most of them, maybe if not all, all of them, they, they didn't serve in the, in the army during World War I, but this was not the case with their cadre because their cadre, many of them, as I said, were actually Wehrmacht officers. And even the one, uh, even the, uh, not, not uh, Wehrmacht, Wehrmacht at the beginning, of course, but uh, later also uh, officers that served during we in the German Imperial Army. And of course, as I said before, they actually taught in school these military issues and it was, we can assume, and as we saw, the, uh, the theory of Auftrags tactic. Now, we should ask ourselves a question. The murder of the Jews, is it a civil mission or a military campaign? Because, why do I ask that? I ask that because, okay, they learned in school military theory, but why should they use a military theory um, in, in, in the mass murder of the Jews, if is it a, a civil mission? Because Auftrag tactic isn't a civil, isn't a civil 
uh, theory. So of course, as many historians are, as already mentioned, the murder of the Jews was kind of a, a, a militarized genocide. And it has many, many similarities into a military campaign, which actually uh, I, I would say caused the officers to use what they know from the Auftrag tactic. I would like now to present some of these similarities to the battlefield so we can see how close uh, is the mass murder in its early stages to a normal military campaign. First, the terminology. We all know that already from the First World War, the German Jews were blamed to stab uh, Germany in the back, the known myth. And in fact, already in the, 19, uh, in the 1920s, of course, 30s and later, the terminology of the campaigns against the Jews were war terminology. It was always um, told like a war, the, the Jews were an enemy that need to be defeated and so on. Later, we can speak about danger, physical strain and uncertainty and coincidence. These are all characteristics of the battlefield like, uh, for, for example, Clausewitz um, described in his, uh, in his work in the 19th century. I mean, we spoke uh, before, we spoke about Babiyar. I can just mention that in Babiyar, for example, the Nazis, they thought that around five to 6,000 Jews will appear in the gather uh, point. But actually at the day of the, of the gathering, much larger number appeared. And this, of course, we can just assume that the commanders in the field needed to act very, very quick, to be very, very flexible, to change their uh, programs and so on, like happens uh, in, uh, in, in war. And of course, the coincidence, and when I say danger, I mean that even though the, the Germans were in, in uh, they were stronger all of the time, they also felt sometimes they could feel that they are in danger because at any moment, there could be a rebel, someone can stab them and so on. And of course, the victims could run, could uh, flee and so on. Next thing is the attire. The murders are done when the, uh, the mostly, okay? Mostly is done when they are wearing uniforms. Of course, it is not military uniforms if it's not the, the Wehrmacht who is doing the murders, but even the, the SS has, military, uh, has uniforms that are very similar to the one that soldiers have. They are using guns, machine guns, and so on. And of course, and even sometimes they, uh, there are pictures showing them wearing helmets. Now we can look on the sequence of murder and see how similar is it to a campaign, to a military campaign. In the battle procedure, the commanders were given prior orders. They needed to take plans to divide the area into section, to give each section into different uh, unit. They needed to prepare in uh, cases and comments, what to do if this happens, what to do if that happened. Then in the, in the stage of action and deportation, there was uncertainty, coincidence, danger as we spoke. In murder, they was doing this by firing squad, which of course is very similar to what they done while they learned a military thing and did all of this training. And of course the war, the, those of them who were in war, this can remind him the, the experience of war. And of course the stench, blood, body flesh, crying and screaming and fear. And later the stage of looting and victory celebrations and which we can see actually in the memories of some of the, of the uh, perpetrators, they are saying they call this Siegesfeier, which means victory, uh, victory. They are, they are celebrating the victory, which is of course also happening in the battlefield. So we see that there are many, many similarities into normal uh, campaign. And this is very logical for them to use the Auftrag tactic. Now we will very, very briefly go on two examples. We could give many, many examples of this, of how actually we can see this Auftrag tactic in the battle, in the, in the mass murders. So let's review, for example, the Pripyat Marsh's mass murder. Himmler okay. is giving an order, what? I can give you 10 more minutes if you need. Okay, thank you. So I will do it a, a bit late, a bit uh, slower. Thank you very much. So we can see here um, the order given by, by Himmler to von den Bachzalewski saying uh, what uh, Martin read, all those who are suspected of supporting partisans are not to be shot. Women and uh, are, are to be shot, sorry. Women and children are to be transported. Okay, this 
uh, this order is not really, we can understand what uh, we need to do with those who support the partisans. We can't actually know who are the ones who support the partisans. And we, and we don't really know what to do with the women and children. What does it mean to be transported, where to, and so on. What von den Bach Zalewski gives his uh, Waffen-SS Cavalry Brigade is these two orders to each regiment. To the first, he says, no male Jews are to be left alive, no families left over in the towns and villages. And to the second, he says, explicit order from the Reichswehr-SS, although we saw, of course, that it was not so explicit, all Jews must be shot, drive Jewish women into the marshes. So we can see that these two orders in which the first part is clear and the second isn't was understood differently by the two regiments. The first executed all Jews without distinction uh, by shooting them. And the second executed the men by shooting and they were actually pu pushing the women and children to the swamps, what wasn't so effective in the terms of, of the mass murder. And of course there was a very, a big number of uh, victims that time. So we can see how the order was given very, very in a morphic way. And the commander had the freedom of execution to do whatever he understands will achieve the objective in the best, uh, the best form. We could also speak about uh, the murder in Kamenitz Podolsk in which the Hungarian, the allies of the Germans deported um, from Kompatrus um, thousands of Jews into Ukraine, which caused a very, very big problem then. We can see, for example, that the army, um, the army was very, very concerned about this growing number of Jewish refugees in Ukraine. And they said, uh, the, the, the mil in, in the military uh, franchise, we can see that they wrote that the Jews must be uh, sent back. They didn't say, of course, how and so on, but before anything could actually happen, we know that SS and uh, the high SS and police leader of the South, Friedrich Jekyll, actually took initiative. He, know that he, has a, he knew that he has a problem, that there is a very, very huge number of Jewish refugees in his area. And he actually decided to murder them, although he didn't get any, um, any order to do so. And we know that later he was really honored to, uh, about what he did. The, his uh, his uh, superiors, his commanders really, really like him and took him as a, an example of how a SS officer should act when no uh, commands are given. So this is just two examples of, of this, but we can really, really speak about many, many other uh, examples. But in conclusion, I would just, uh, I would like to say that uh, this, the Auftrag tactic, which is, as I assume, I didn't say, but I assume for many of you, was uh, you, you heard the similarities between the Auftrags tactic to its civil equivalent of the Führer Prinzip. So the Auftrags tactic was actually a very important thing in the education of the SS cadets and later in the implementation during the mass murders. And uh, we should more, we should look closer on this uh, military theory when we actually look on those uh, mass murders in further uh, research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Noah. It was very interesting, I'm considering that I'm also working in, uh, in, with the army. So I really feel that it's uh, giving me some more ideas about teaching my uh, new officers. Uh, our uh, third participant is uh, Dr. Leonid Rhein. Dr. Leonid Ryan is from the International Institute for Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem. Dr. Ryan's uh, profound work was uh, a, a book named uh, The King and the Funds, Collaboration in, uh, Belarusian, in Belarusia during World War II. The book was uh, published at 2011, as I mentioned. And two more books, very interesting. Um, at 2018, Belarusian Exile Police, Accelerate Police. And the second and the third one was the Belarusian Home Guard. From out. 2017. Um, Professor Ryan, uh, Dr. Ryan will speak about the, uh, the death 
we were giving to them was quite quiet and beautiful. The mass murder of Soviet Jews in uh, letters by German servicemen. Uh, Professor Ryan, the screen is yours. Thank you, Yvonne. I, now I will try to share my screen. Uh, Hopefully you can see me. So, uh, okay. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me for this uh, meeting, for this conference, uh, which uh, is very, very uh, insightful, very, very interesting. And uh, the second, uh, I think uh, it would be in place to give some uh, warnings that my both my lecture and my presentation would contain some graphical images and descriptions. So, okay, so let's start. On October 3rd, 1941, some 2000 Jews from the city of Mogilev of various ages and of both sexes were taken to the Jewish cemetery. About a dozen, dozen what happened? Wait. Something. Ah, yes. About a dozen, sorry, about a dozen kilometers uh, outside the city, forced to lie face down in ditches and had been dug in advance and shot in the back of the head. Two days later, one of the perpetrators of this massacre. Police Secretary Walter Matner, whose uh, picture you can see here, who served at the headquarters of the HSS and police commander in central Russia, wrote to his pregnant wife in Vienna, uh, quote, unquote, I took part in a mass killing on the day before yesterday. After the first truckload of Jews, my hand trembled a little while shooting, but one gets used to it. By the 10th truckload, I was already aiming steadily and shooting accurately at the many women, children, and babies. I thought about the two infants that I had at, ho at home, to whom this gang would do exactly the same, if not 10 times worse. The death we were meting out to them was a quick and beautiful, one compared to the hellish sufferings of many thousands in the torture chambers of the Soviet GPU, the, baby, the babies went flying through the air in a long arc, and we shot them down as they flew before they fell into the grave, into the water. Let's get rid of this brute who have pushed all of Europe into war and who are now edging America on until it too is dragged into the war. The words of Hitler, who on one occasion before the war said, if the Jews believe they can once more ignite a war in Europe, then this will not be a victory for the Jews, but rather the end of Jewry in Europe will come true. The war against the Soviet Union was fundamentally different, end of quote. As the war against the Soviet Union was fundamentally different from the wars waged by the Third Reich in 1939-1940. It wasn't merely about vanquishing the enemy army or conquering their territory. Rather, the Nazi German leadership viewed it from the beginning as a clash of ideologies and as a crusade to protect Western civilization from the judeo bolshevist onslaught. The Jews were regarded in this context as the main pillars of the Bolshevist system as the elements who were a priori hostile to the Germans. They were thus held capable for any transgressions against German troops and were to be shot dead. Hence, physical violence against the Jews, accompanied by uh, the German invasion of the Soviet Union from its first day. German servicemen advancing through Soviet territory witnessed this violence, participated in it, captured it on film, and recorded it in letters they sent home to their loved ones and in the diaries that some of them kept. Three and a half million German soldiers, along with approximately 15,000 other insecurity policemen took part in the invasion of the Soviet Union. 
By no means all of them wrote letters and many of the letters that were written haven't been preserved for posterity. The German historian Klaus Latzel, who studied the written legacy of German soldiers in two world wars, has calculated that some 40 billion postal items were circulated between the front line and the Germany during World War II. It is difficult to say how many of these were field post letters and how many of those were mailed from the Eastern Front. Moreover, scholars have access only to a fraction of these letters, which are kept in various archives. For example, the archives of the Library of Modern History, Bibliothek für Zeitgeschichte in Stuttgart, Germany. Furthermore, the letters and diaries that are accessible to us contain few references to Jews or to their murder. Latzel, once again, who performed an analysis of the letters of frontline German troops in World War II about two decades ago, compiled a list of 52 most frequently raised topics in these letters, ranking them in descending order. The first five items on this list are service or work, leave home, fighting, food and supplies, and the war situation. By contrast, the topic of Jews and persecution of Jews is much less common, being merely the 45th item on the list. Another important factor that should be considered when working with letters and to a lesser extent with diaries is censorship, both the official military censorship and the soldiers' propensity to self-censor. Even if the official guidelines about which subjects were taboo in soldiers' letters didn't explicitly mention the final solution, it was widely understood that this was a top secret matter, one uh, never written and never to be written about, to quote Himmler's infamous 1943 Posen speech. Still, as the letter quoted about shows, German soldiers and policemen serving on the Eastern Front did write about the massacres of Jews which they had, which they had witnessed or in which they had directly participated. In this way, they, exp as they expanded the circle of Germans who were privy to the atrocities being committed, thereby refuting the apologetic claim widespread in post-war Germany that we knew nothing about it. As has already been said, German soldiers advancing into the Soviet territory largely accepted the view of Jews as an anti-German element, as a security threat, and as a primary driving force behind the anti-German resistance. The shootings of individual Jews and of groups of Jews accused of anti-German activities were perceived as a matter of course. Thus, Major Reich, assistant chief of staff of the 25th motorized division, registered in his diary with dry dispassion. July 2nd, 1941, Jews shot. July 13th, a German air army airman killed, 50 Jews shot. End of quote. In the areas that had been annexed by the Soviet Union in 1939-1940, especially in the Baltic region in Western Ukraine, the local population greeted the German troops with cheers. I quote, the Lithuanian civilians staged an incredible reception for us. We were literally showered with flowers. End of quote. Wrote the tank gunner Karl Fuchs from the 7th Panzer Division to his father, describing his unit's entry into Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, on June 24, 1941. And also with massacres of Jews, which perpetrated by local nationalists. While we must presume that some of the Wehrmacht soldiers and officers who witnessed this brutal violence against innocent people felt abhorrence and indignation, the letters we have at our disposal indicate that other soldiers readily accepted the explanation given by the organizers of these pogroms, namely that this was just retribution visited upon the Jews for the atrocities they had allegedly committed during the Soviet period. Major H. Shah from 652nd Pioneer Battalion wrote on July 11, 41. In the old citadel of Lutsk, on this day, uh, July 2nd, 1941, 1,000 Jews were shot. This is in retaliation for the 2,800 uh, 2, Ukrainians 
shot during the Bolshevist time, end of quote. Lieutenant K from the 45th, 44th Corps Signal Unit of the 1st Army Corps openly admitted that he and his comrades were enthusiastic readers of the violently anti-Semitic and pornographic Der Sturmer newspaper, wrote home on February 13th, 14, 1942, recalling his experiences back in 1941. The most diabolic and criminal system of all times is the Jewish system of the, in the Soviet paradise. It is the paradise for the Jews. We witnessed Russian murders in Lemberg, Zlochev. I personally witnessed them in Tarnopol and elsewhere. It is indescribable. The ring leaders behind all these criminals were Jews. In Tarnopol in particular, it was Jewish physicians and sergeants who actually dissected the bodies after these racial murders. I will never forget the popular anger." End of quote. Here we see the integration of the age-old blood libel into a narrative about the real crimes of the NKVD. Also, the official position of the Wehrmacht vis-a-vis -vis these programs was one of non-intervention. Individual soldiers took an active part in them. A soldier whose first name was Franz wrote to his parents in Vienna from Tarnopol in East Galicia on July 6, 1941. I'm just, uh, I quote, I just back from the procedure of laying out the bodies of our comrades from the Air Force and the mountain troops who were captured by Russians. I found no words, I find no words to describe such things. The comrades were chained. Their ears, tongues, noses, and genitals had been cut off. We, would we found them in this state in the cellars of the court building of Tarnopol, here in the picture. And we also found 2,000 Ukrainians and ethnic Germans mutilated in the same way. Now the Jews were forced to bring the bodies out of the cellar and lay them down carefully. They had to face the outrage they, they had committed. Then, after they had seen the victims, they were beaten to death with truncheons and spades. Up to this moment, we have dispatched some 1,000 Jews into the next world. But this number is too small compared to what they did, end of quote. In late summer, early fall 1941, the spontaneous pogroms and murders of individual Jews or small groups of Jews gave way to the total annihilation of entire Jewish communities, including women and children. Some 25,000 Jews of all ages and of both sexes were murdered by members of the SS Cavalry Brigade in Pripyat marches, a border region uh, between Belarus and Ukraine, in early August 1941. Approximately 20,000 Jews were murdered in Kamenets Podolsk at the end of the month. We just heard about it in the previous lecture. A distinguished feature of the murder of the Soviet Jewry is the fact that the massacres usually took place in the open, not infrequently in the prisons, presence of the spectators from among the local population and the German army. The German soldiers who witnessed these massacres were not deterred from describing them in detail in their letters home. Thus, HK Paymaster of the 610th Auto Park, which was stationed in Brest, gave the dialect, uh, di detailed account of the massacre of some 1,000 Jews in Beroza Kartuska in July 1942 in a letter. He wrote that Jews of all ages and of both sexes has been brought to a pit outside of the town, forced to strip naked and shot in the back of the hand, head. Uh, I quote, I'm convinced, remarked HK, that should the war drag on for much longer, the Jews will be processed into sausages and fed to the Russian POWs or to skilled Jewish workers, end of quote. Many of the letters written reaffirm the view of the murder of Jews as a necessary measure, as just retribution for the Jews' alleged misdeeds or even as part of Germany's struggle for survival. Gefreiter, private first class LB, who served with the 269th Infantry Division, wrote on September 28, 1941, a day before the beginning of the Babi Yar massacre in Kiev. I quote, the city has been burning for eight days now, and this is all the Jews' handiwork. Therefore, Jews aged 16 to six, uh, 14 to 60 
were shot and the Jewish women will be shot too. Otherwise, it will never end. End of quote. As can be seen in at least some of the letters, the writers were well aware that the goal of the Third Reich was a total extermination of the Jews and they viewed it as a necessary step to ensure Germany's survival. For us, it is the question of Jewish world domination that forces us to choose between the solution of the Jewish question and the extermination of the German people. It is already a religious war. That means a very radical one. It, even, it, it will end in total annihilation. Wrote Lieutenant K.N. from the 149th Coastal Artillery Detachment in a letter dated February 24, 1942. The anti Semitism of German troops was inflamed by the rapidly anti Semitic newspaper Der Stürmer. Also, after the war, many German veterans would vehemently deny ever holding this paper in their hands. Der Stürmer circulated among the German troops on the Eastern Front, and the messages it conveyed were pro approved by the readers, giving rise to genocidal thoughts in the might of quite a few of them. I quote, the Stürmer is a good combat newsletter and it gives enlightenment and education to those who unlike ourselves cannot see all this with their own eyes. I have now served in the East for two and a half years and believe me, it was here that we became aware of how dangerous the Jews really are. Eradication and extermination are the only options and we are hoping that the day isn't far off when the last Jew digs his own grave. End of quote. Rod, the non commissioned officer HH from the 990 Reserve Battalion, a subscriber of Der Stürmer in early September 1942. Those German servicemen who directly participated in the massacres and shot Jews with their own guns, such as Walter Matner, whom I quoted at the beginning of my presentation, likewise tried hard to convince both themselves in the addresses of their letters that by killing innocent men, women, and children, including nursing infants, they were doing a great service to the German people in punishing the Jews for their alleged misdeeds. SS Obersturmführer Karl Kreschmer, who served with Zonderkommander 4A of Einsatzgruppe C, which murdered tens of thousands of Ukrainian Jews and was responsible for the Babi Yar massacre, uh, among others, wrote to his wife on September 27, 1942. The sight of the dead, including women and children, isn't very cheering. But we are fighting this war for the survival or annihilation of our people. My comrades are literally fighting for the existence of our people. The enemy would do the same. As the war is, in our opinion, a Jewish war, the Jews are the first to feel it. Here in Russia, wherever the German soldier is, no German remains, end of quote. On more than one occasion, the letters write, quote, Hitler's infamous speech of January 30, 1939, when referring to the mass murder of Jews. As we have seen, Walter Matner refers to it in the letter quoted above. Gefreiter, private first class HS from the Sinal Company, also mentioned it in a letter written in August 1941. I quote, the impressive thoroughness with which the Jewish question is being solved is a chapter in its own right. As the Fuhrer said in one of his speeches shortly before the outbreak of war, when Jewry succeeds one more in plunging the peoples of Europe into a senseless war, it will mean the end of this race in Europe. End of quote. Uh, end of quote. The Jew should know that the Fuhrer usually means what he says, and we can now see the appropriate consequences of his words. These are ruthlessly severe, but necessary for ensuring the calm and peace for the, of the people." End of quote. We may conclude that Hitler's so-called prophecy was invoked by both the perpetrators and the witnesses of the massacres as an alibi of sorts for posterity. It would be wrong to assume that the murder of Jews was met with universal approval by the Germans who participated in the Soviet campaign. While most of the writers of the letters we have at our disposal sincerely believed that butchering innocent people was the way to bring salvation to the German people, other voices can be heard too. On May 7th, 1942, the soldier Paul Riedel wrote in his diary, 
when the sorrow in which we have drawn others washed over us, what to you, German people? What to you? 30,000 Jews were murdered in Kharkov. In Kiev, they killed 70,000 Jews. They have been eradicated in all the cities. This happens in the 20th century, and the cultural nation has done it, end of quote. Also, the Jews and their physical annihilation are not mentioned very often in the letters home sent by Germans fighting on the Eastern Front or in the diaries they kept. The letters and diary entries that do bring up this subject show that the writers had largely adapted and internalized the Nazi view of the Jews as the primary bearers of Soviet ideology and the perpetrators of Soviet crimes. Most of the diarists and letter writers also accepted the view of the campaign against the Soviet Union as a crusade of sorts to protect Germany and Europe as a whole from the judeo bolshevist onslaught, or even as an existential struggle between the Aryans and Jews. At the same time, the letters home by some German servicemen from the Eastern Front helped to demolish, uh, to demolish the myth of the total ignorance of German society regarding the ongoing annihilation of the Jews. Quite a few of the letters available to us not only contain references to the mass murder of Jews, but also give details of massacres which the writers had witnessed, or is in, as in the cases of police officer Matner and SS Obersturmführer Kretschmer been actively involved in. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Leonid, for your detailed uh, research and speak. Um, we will continue now with the uh, Forish uh, Akos, a lecture from uh, Budapest, from uh, Etwas Leonard University, and uh, his uh, research or his speech will be about the first uh, partisan hunt of the Hungarian occupation forces, mass murder in Buki in November 1941. Um, Mr. Flores, uh, Dr. Flores is a research at the Clio Institute and a lecturer at the Department of Auxiliary uh, Studies of History, uh, of Evertus Laurent University. His study studies has been have been carried out in history and archive BA and MA at Evertus Laurent University. is currently a doctoral candidate at the university. <laughs> the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh... Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, based on the order of the Hungarian occupation group, the first anti-partisan operation of the Hungarian occupation forces took place in early November 1941. I'm sorry. According to praise of the Hungarian National Occupation Group's command, the third company of the 5th Infantry Regiment in the Buki area, at the request of German air authorities, handled harmless 137 persons. The effectiveness of this action is further signified by the promotion of many members of the company with the second class iron cross for their success in the partisan hunting. However, the RA sources showing that the majority of the 137 and 37 people executed during the anti-partisan action were unarmed Jewish citizens. In my presentation, I reconstruct the events based on Hungarian and German military documents, uh, the Hungarian war crime style in the case of uh, these massacres, and the allocation of the inhabitants of Turkey. The company of 50-3 was the third company of the battalion 50-1. The battalion arrived in the occupied territories 
as the part of the 37th uh, Infantry Regiment of the 124th Infantry Brigade. During the mobilization of the occupation forces, the battalion was set up as a new unit. Therefore, the majority of the members of the battalion were recruits and reserves. The soldiers were low of trained. They got only a six weeks of basic training supplemented by guard duty training. The soldiers of the battalion left Hungary on October 6 or 7, 1941. The unit was transported only as far as the Hungarian border and the distance from Tata or Jablonitsky uh, passed to Gaisin on, or uh, Yuman, covered by marching 30, 40 kilometers a day. Uh, this area is the Hungarian occupation forces uh, in 1941. Uh, and uh, Geisin uh, is in the uh, western part of the occupation group. And uh, it's uh, Geisin here, uh, the border, the uh, Hungarian occupation group, and the uh, uh, 400. Uh, four, um, 54th uh, Security uh, Division. And the battalion arrived in Uman on October 30. The, at this uh, settlement, as initially planned, the company was to rest for three days and take over the garrison size in Geisin from the uh, border fighter battalion. However, on November 1st, the company was alerted by its commander, First Lieutenant Imasabo. The battalion commander, uh, Major Miklos Park, ordered the company to a mission, sitting the local German commander asked to help against the uh, partisans. During the briefing, Mikos Pat reported to the soldiers who had been deployed that a riot had broken out in village. According to the battalion commander, the company soldiers were to neutralize Russian paratroopers and Jewish bandits looting and burning inside Buki. Based on the contemporary German and Soviet sources, it can be, be stated that the Soviet partisan groups were not in the area until 1943. From the beginning of the war against the Soviet Union, orders and directives issued for the German army considered Jews as acquiesced to partisans, bandits, and raiders, and constitute them an unreliable and hostile population. The main reason reason for this not supposition that the Jewish population of the occupied territories actively assisted uh, the German army, but the fact that depicting the Jews as an enemy, it was easier for the German and uh, German allied army to verify the mass elimination of civil population, mainly women, children, and the elderly. The, the uh, 454 uh, security division occupying the Buki area also took part in the Holocaust in this way. Thus, uh, this formation shoot uh, 92 Jews and politically suspect persons in October 1941 on the grounds of sabotage and 180. Uh, nine partisans, communists, Jews, and NKVD members in November. This approach was also followed by the Hungarian Homeward Army on the Eastern Front. Although the Hungarian forces, unlike Germans, did not have a such a goal of the extermination Jews, 
the anti-Semitic use of the Hungarian defense forces contributing to the discrimination of the Jews as part of the military profession. First, they were considered as an annihilable element, and then they were categorized as hostile. During the occupation of Voivodia in April 1941, and the fights against uh, Soviet Union in, in the summer of 1941, Jews were presented as an annihilable element, but from 1941 onwards, they were undoubtedly treated as enemies of Hungarian defense forces. Buki was an important settlement for Ukrainian Jewry. In the late 19th century, nearly 60% of population was Jewish. Due to programs surrounding the Russian Civil War and the influx of the population to the big cities during the Soviet period, the Jewish population in Buki declined. According to the 1939 census, more than uh, 500 uh, Jews lived in the settlement. According to uh, other sources, the settlement came under German occupation from 19 uh, July or uh, 20 July 1941. Following the conscription into uh, Red Army and the flight to the east before the German armies, about 60% of Jewish population remained in Buki. At the start of the occupation, the Jewish population of the settlement was Adishtai. The star of uh, David Ambad was ordered to be born and forced labor organized. Even before the arrival of Hungarians, mass murders had already taken place in uh, Buki. In August 1941, dozens of Jews were shot by the Germans around the settlement. From Uman to Company first traveled the train to Potash, and from there they continued on foot to Buki. The company reached Buki on November 2nd. Here the uh, commander immediately contacted uh, the German Landwirtschaftsführer, uh, Sonderführer Friedrich Schaff. The battalion commander sent first Lieutenant Sabo's company on its way by pacing company entirely under the command of the German commander in Buki. He strictly ordered that to obey the orders of the German officers. In Boki, no independent local uh, uh, command uh, or commandant was set up, but the village was led by the district uh, agricultural leader men mentioned Lenzonderfuerfuchschef. On the orders of the Wehrmacht's Befest Haber Ukraine, in those settlements, where now station headquarters, we established the most senior officers in rank was assigned these duties. Accordingly, the land chefs who were not only responsible for the supervising agricultural production, but were also symbol of the German presence. The Ukrainian militia led by the starosta was also set up in uh, Buki, in Duki, the armed forces were made up uh, of the enemy of the Soviet regime, those classified as uh, kulaks or deserters from the uh, Red Army. These so-called policemen had been involved in the anti-Jewish action before the November events. The newly uh, arrived Hungarian company was probably deployed in Buki because the local uh, Landwirtschaftsführer and the uh, uh, Ostkommandant in Uman could not solve the murder of the Jewish local forces. The Ukrainian militia of the Ostkommandant in Uman was also short of weapons, and the uh, 454th uh, 
security divisions uh, units were teed up in Cherkasy on a so-called anti-partisan operation. The activities in Buki of the company can be divided into two stages. On November 3 and 4, the Hungarian Soviet took part in scoring uh, the forest around the settlement. The first day, the Hungarians were deployed the northwest of the settlement, and the next day to the south. Uh, the, south. the forest scoring ordered in the bookery may have been a preparation for the mass murder uh, on November 5th, that is, the rounding up of those who had fled into the forest to escape German regulation. Memorable locals point out that several Jews um, fled to the hot quarters around Buki. Such action by the Hungarian troops is not unprecedented. In December 1941, Battalion uh, 409-2 was deployed for a similar purpose in the Chudnov area. Participants in the so-called partisan hunt led by Sheb had already committed the first murders. On November 3rd, according to the contemporary report, the company members found only one suspicion man who tried to escape and was shot. However, the records of the post-war people's court proceeding showed that Chap had shot a Jewish man uh, to date who had been brought along, scored the Jews escaped in the forest. On following day, the Serbians shot two so called bandits and arrested a Jew. The local agricultural leader attributed the raid on November uh, 5th to the trait of partisan violence. He justified the roundup of the suspects of the, to the Hungarians by claiming that the Jews in the settlement had informed the partisans that the forest had been so coarsed and therefore failed to find the resistance. The connection of the local jury with the partisans as well as their preparation for elect sabotage gave the case of the massacre and its unrealistic legitimacy. In reality, van der Hand, this mass murder fits into the October-November 1941 massacres of the 454th German Security Division. On the other hand, uh, Sheb preparator to set up an Antonovka Forced Camp li uh, labor camp next uh, to Buki. On the evening of November 4th, uh, Sheb summoned the local starosta who was instructed to summon the uh, Ukrainian militia in the village in the morning to take part in the end up of the Jews. The next morning, the Jews were hand up by the Ukrainian militia for uh, the most part. The Jews were collected in the front of the village hall and driven from there to a van like building. Members of the Hungarian company were not involved uh, in the selection of the residents. Manuel, First Lieutenant Sabo, divided the Hungarian company in three parts. One group was in charge of escorting prisoners, another responsible for house searches, and third was take with the quartermaster duty. The three better officers in charge of the search had a double test. On the one hand, they had to prevent the villagers and the militiamen from the removing the Jewish belongings in these houses. On the other hand, they had to search the evacuated Jewish homes 
for the official hidden uh, weapons. This effectively means collecting wheelbarrows and carrying them to German officers' apartment. After the Ukrainian militiamen released the prisoners, the Hungarian and Ukrainian began to escort the crowd. The assembly's people were led first along a road and then across muddy field to rain and pit there. Here, the Ukrainian uh, militia led the victims to the pit, and the victims had been stripped of their clothes. Hungarian soldiers were also directly involved in the stripping of um, Jews, and the Hungarian soldiers also took some of the clothes that had been piled at the grave. The commander of the Hungarian prisoners group, Sergeant Mesar Shishvan, ordered a volley of the shoots from the edge of uh, one of uh, the dugout pits. After many of the victims fell into the pit, wounded but not dead, the Jews were then killed one by one, shooting the back of the head. Hungarian soldiers carried out the execution by turns. The Ukrainian militiamen were responsible for leading the victims one by one the pit. And uh, and the end of the uh, mass murder, the Ukrainian militia carried away the clothes and executed in a car. They, these were later used to close the prisoners in the camp in Antonovka. The tombs were not immediately covered, the Essing militiamen more likely uh, buried them. The Hungarian soldiers took part in the massacres to varying degrees. Uh, for example, uh, Private Mihai Varga became ill at the execution site and retreated to the infirmary. The soldier was not subjected to any uh, reprisals. Other states were formed the execution process, sitting the pursuit of the uh, Fergian. But uh, Josef Schön uh, shot a mother and her doctor did with a submachine gun during the execution, and he boasted about uh, it at the dinner in the company carter. The company left uh, Buki in the next uh, day and arrived uh, Uman uh, on November 7th. The involvement of company uh, 50-C in the mass murder is not an extreme outburst of the Hungarian Defense Forces, but the beginning of a series of mass murders. The battalion was involved in the two further mass killings in autumn and winter 1941. The, the battalion uh, 49 slash 7 and the uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nandor Papa replaced the battalion 50 slash 1 in Geisin was involved in about six further mass murders in April 1941 and again at the end of May. However, we can detect a certain change of function in the commission of the later mass murders as the killings were primarily carried out by specialists from the Eisensgruppe uh, 5. While in Buki, the company members played the direct role in the massacre, in the other massacre, Hungarian soldiers did not perform other tests than uh, beleaguering, ghetto, and escorting the victims to the execution pit. Uh, similarly, uh, the Ukrainian militiamen uh, in Buki. 
this was probably because the Einsatz and some of their commandos, which were transformed from the mobile units into SD commands, organized the, the execution of the killings more effectively. The experience of the first few months has shown that we careful about so-called division of labor, labor for mass killings. Thank you for attention. Thank you so much for your interesting uh, talk. Uh, I will uh, open the ground now for a question. We have now 20 minute uh, question, uh, four questions. So uh, I can see that uh, someone already wrote something. Let me see to Leonid and to uh, Professor uh, Westerman. Shmuley, um, Kirushalmi and Daniel. Right, then. So, yes. um, Ed Edward, would you like to? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Yvonne, and thanks to all the panelists for their papers. Uh, in response to Shmuel's uh, question, uh, I think he's absolutely right in terms of the expatriate communities, Lithuanian, Latvian, Ukrainian, and North America, especially after World War II, posited uh, those countries as victims of Soviet aggression and uh, essentially, uh, essentially discarded their own participation uh, in annihilation. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, a couple with respect to Lithuania, Rita Gabas, uh, a guest at the Shooter's Banquet, Sylvia Foti's book, The Nazi's Granddaughters, looks at uh, the uh, perpetration by family members, grandfathers uh, in, uh, uh, of these auxiliaries. So there's quite a bit about that, an academic study of, uh, that looks at that is Katrin Reichel's uh, German book on Latvian and the German uh, occupation. So the point is there's a great deal of evidence uh, showing how these auxiliaries were involved uh, in killing. And one specific example I can give in my own research is I have several instances where Latvian or Lithuanian uh, killing groups come back from killing operations and they're singing nationalist songs. And I found that very important because what they're doing is they're asserting a Latvian or Lithuanian national identity while denouncing or denationalizing through song their Jewish, uh, their Jewish victims. And uh, Daniela's uh, uh, question about uh, the auxiliary participation, I think one of the things we have to remember about that is certainly the Aras Commando is, is big uh, if we look at Latvia, but there's a lot of Ordnungspolizei uh, and Sicherheitspolizei or security police uh, auxiliaries who are operating under German command who are involved in these killings as well. So you have a mixture in some cases of auxiliaries with German forces. And the reason I showed that slide for La Paya that shows about a 5,000, 6,000 difference in the numbers of killed is because we have the, uh, the Einsatzgruppen that are reporting killings, but we have all these other groups that are involved. So Ordnungspolizei, Security Police, uh, Wehrmacht, and so what we see is a lot of those numbers that we use uh, in our discussions of killing uh, are, uh, are really suspect in terms of we have to be able to integrate them uh, at, a great, uh, at, a greater, uh, at a greater level. And I think that that's important because we're missing, we're missing pieces here, especially in these smaller scale killings. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, Leonid, uh, you had a remark to Edward and Noam. Would you like to? Uh, would you like to ask them or to remark it out loud? Uh, yes. Uh, so with Noam, uh, we already spoke in private uh, conversation. So uh, I. Uh, clear, we cleared the matter, but uh, with Edward, yes, uh, there was an amateur, I only wanted to say that there was an amateur uh, short film of the German soldier, I don't remember. In our project Untold Stories in Yad Vashem, we have uh, his 
film where he shows there the, the very short film uh, where he shows also the involvement of the navy, navy personnel there, uh, which act in near the graves there as the shooters. Yeah, Leonid, uh, that's the Reinhard Wiener film, and yeah, it's yeah, from yeah. July and August exactly. 1941. And uh, uh, the Holocaust Museum, it's also available on their website if people want to look at it. But what's very interesting about it, it shows uh, trucks arriving with groups of six to 10 Jewish men, and they're being escorted to a shooting pit in the sand dunes. But the most fascinating part of that, uh, uh, of that uh, scene is you have hundreds of uh, spectators who are military spectators from the local base at La Paya that are standing around smoking. You have dogs running around uh, the, uh, the execution site uh, and watching, essentially spectating uh, at, at this site. So it gives you a real idea of uh, widespread knowledge of these killings in particular at this area based on the location of the naval base, uh, but it also shows you very closely uh, these smaller scale killings that are taking place in the sand dunes at, uh, at the naval base area. Okay, anyone else? Okay. I see that there are a few questions to me also. Of yeah. Jeff and also of Caroline. I can see Jeffrey. Yeah. Yeah, of Jeff and of Caroline. So uh, to Jeffrey, I only can say, you see, we cannot uh, enter the minds of these people. Surely there were people like uh, Walter Matner or Kretschmer or and Kretschmer, who were ideological, who were SS members, active SS members. Matner was promoted to the lieutenant as a, by Himmler himself. So these were really ideological soldiers, and it seems that they were really convinced of uh, what they were writing. Uh, in other cases, it's uh, more difficult to say uh, whether they really believed in what they uh, it's for sure they underwent the years of indoctrination to absorb, so they had like uh, between uh, the rise to power of the Nazis, uh, it were some 10 years, about 10 years, they have a process of undergoing the indoctrination to absorb and undergo this indoctrination and internalize this uh, Nazi ideology, Nazi indoctrination. Now, uh, so actually I cannot say how much they uh, really believe, it's difficult to, to, to say at least outside of Matner and uh, Kretschmer, how much they really believed it. Now uh, for Caroline, uh, as far as I know about the letters as a, a, a judicial staff, as the evidence by the trials, I know that uh, the Matner's letters, yes, they were. Actually, the whole story with the Matner's letter is quite interesting because they were found by some uh, Jewish Romanian students who rented an apartment of the Austrian uh, lady in Vienna who happened to be Wattner's wife, Matner's wife. And he found these letters in a drawer in her apartment. He came with them to the police and police also with the uh, assistance with, uh, of the Israeli uh, Nazi hunter Tuvia Friedman uh, started an investigation, they apprehended uh, Matner himself, who was hiding in the lower Austria, and then uh, they brought him to trial, basing on these letters also, they used these letters, and he was uh, ultimately tried and hanged. So in case of Matner, yes, we know that they were used, but uh, otherwise I have no, I cannot answer this. Thank you. Michael?
What I would respond to that is the velocity that we see in the murders, especially in the Baltics, really pinpoints uh, the act of murder of Jewish populations as being intrinsic uh, to the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. So I think that the important thing, uh, you know, when we talk about Madagascar, uh, there's a couple of misconceptions there. Number one, obviously uh, the Germans can't do it because they don't have the transport capability and they don't control the seas. But Madagascar was also not just dropping off Jews and leaving them there. It was going to be a giant concentration site run by the SS again. So uh, when people talk about Madagascar, a lot of times I think they have the mistaken impression that this was a way to isolate Jews from Germany and Germany would have been happy, uh, kind of like forced migration but I, uh, or immigration. But uh, I, I think that that's important to, to mention that, that, uh, that that was not going to be a site just leaving Jews there and going away. They would have still been under German control. Daniel, you had a question for Leonid? Leonid, you've been asked to send us a link to the footage here in the chat. To, 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 to what? To, to Leopard? Do you mean Leopard? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I, maybe uh, during the break. <laughs> I, I sent already during the previous uh, conference in June. I also sent you. Oh, here, Michael just. <laughs> the, the, yeah, we, we already. The link to our site, actually, to where it is, to site of our project. <laughs> okay, there's no more questions. Is somebody else what would, you, would like to ask something? Well, okay, thank you all. Thank you for your marvelous uh, research and uh, speak to us. Um, we will have a 20 minute break and then uh, we will back, get back to our uh, next session, the killings. <laughs>